miracle out of mould. That same green mould which everyone has seen growing in bread or ruining fruit and vegetables. This evil looking fungus would still be regarded as a pest were it not for a brilliant doctor, Professor Alexander Fleming of St Mary's Hospital London, who discovered that it produces the drug known as penicillin, the marvellous new cure for various types of blood poisoning. The romantic story of penicillin started in 1929, when by chance some mould was blown onto a deadly germ culture with which Fleming was experimenting. From that chance, plus the observation that round the mould the microbes were dying, has come a life-saving drug. A specimen has been sent from overseas to the South African Medical Research Institute in order to obtain a standard culture. From this small pellet, the fungus will be made to grow. It is treated with very great care, for on it many lives will depend. The pellet is dropped into a fluid and emulsified. There are many kinds of penicillium mould, but this is the only one which has the power to produce the healing drug. The solution is then placed in other tubes containing a culture medium, in which it will thrive and grow. It's a slow process which accounts for the small quantities available. The solution is next put into a cool incubator, where it has to remain for three or four days. During this time, a minor wonder takes place, for the mould flourishes and advances a stage nearer the day when it will yield penicillin. And this is what it looks like after its stay in the incubator. It's now placed in specially designed flasks for further incubation, but here the process is slower. At the end of three weeks, the penicillin has been formed. It's not the white layer you see on the top, but the liquid beneath it. The precious fluid is taken from the flask. This is the drug which has already saved the lives of hundreds of men seriously wounded on the battlefield, and which has revolutionized medical science. This shows you what the new drug can do. Both tubes contained a deadly germ. Penicillin was placed in one of them, and that is now perfectly clear. The process is still laborious. The next problem is how to produce penicillin in bulk. Scientists are working hard on that job. This is what the wonder fungus looks like under the microscope. It's one of the greatest discoveries in the history of medicine, the result of the work of a British scientist, Professor Alexander Fleming. Once again, Lord Nuffield comes forward as Britain's premier philanthropist. He watches a demonstration of the new iron lung, which he is mass producing at Cowley, for presentation to hospitals all over Britain and the Empire. Lord Nuffield himself is on the right. The iron lung is the latest scientific instrument to help in the cure of infantile paralysis. Often with that dread disease, the patient's chest and breathing muscles become completely paralyzed, leading to suffocation and death within a few hours, unless some form of artificial breathing can be found. In the iron lung, the patient's body is placed in an airtight box, sealed at the neck, and a pump automatically raises and lowers the pressure inside, expanding and contracting the patient's chest. By this means, life can be preserved for a few hours, or months, or even years. And it isn't a hopeless last resource, for while the iron lung induces artificial breathing, doctors have the opportunity of curing the disease, and most patients leave their temporary prisons completely cured. We join with Lord Nuffield in the hope he expresses. I sincerely hope that my gift will be the means of saving many valuable lives. I'm the manager of a savings bank with branches all over the country. But we are by no means an ordinary savings bank. In fact, our vaults contain something much more valuable. They contain flasks of life-giving blood and plasma. During 1948, nearly 300,000 men and women will each have given half an hour of their time and two-thirds of a pint of blood to maintain this service. When the blood transfusion service makes an appeal in your district, please volunteer to become a donor. I'm sure some of you here are already regular donors, and I feel that you would like to meet Raymond Charles. Raymond Charles was born suffering from an incurable blood disease, 
but his life was saved because modern medical science had made it possible to drain away all his own diseased blood and replace it with a healthy supply from a blood bank. Raymond Charles, as you can see, is deeply grateful. Thank you, blood donors. Dr. Jonas Salk, discoverer of the first successful vaccine against infantile paralysis, gives the first official reports to a waiting world at the University of Michigan. Dr. Salk's own child was one of the two million children involved in tests of his vaccine. Tests which have ended for all time the threat of one of the world's most vicious diseases. Doctors Francis and O'Connor have been close collaborators in the vaccine's development. Dr. Francis personally carried out the extensive experiments with the help of Canadian laboratories, and it will be developed further. Now, the thing to remember is that this is a continuous process, and all that we can say is that the experience as acquired a year ago was, as reported today, uh, the experience with a test of a vaccine uh, that could be made today is likely to be considerably better. So the news is spread. Children and adults soon can be vaccinated against polio. No news has ever been more gratefully received. To a house in Stoke Pogis, once the home of music hall star Vesta Tilly, Glaxo chairman Sir Harry Jeffcott welcomes the Minister of Health, Mr. Dennis Vosper. The minister has come to inspect the production of polyvarin. British anti-polio vaccine, which has already given 200,000 children a powerful defense against this dreadful disease. This department produces the liquid medium in which the culture is to be prepared. Tissue of monkey kidneys is cut up to receive the virus. There are three types of polio virus. A strain of each is prepared separately. The blending will come later to make a vaccine which will give protection against all three forms. 100% cleanliness and the most rigid precautions are enforced for the infected culture is deadly at this stage. An incubator room brings the culture to maturity. This process takes four days during which the culture is kept in motion. The final vaccine, of course, contains only dead virus. Formalin treatment will kill off all live virus and a foolproof system of checking and double checking will ensure that it has done so. This British vaccine is a modification of the Salk vaccine, which has had such great success in the United States. Britain has learned from America's mistakes and has taken stringent measures to ensure that there will be no repetition of the American accident in which a faultily tested batch caused a local outbreak of the very disease it was intended to prevent. It will not happen here. When the three different strains of vaccine are ready, they are blended in the right proportions to give maximum immunity. There's enough vaccine to give 100,000 anti-polio inoculations in each of these great vessels. And the contents of each vessel is worth 20,000 pounds. A lot of money, but a small price for safeguarding the future of 100,000 children. Coffin nails. Yes, that's what cigarettes are, according to the Medical Research Council. We've all heard something of the kind before, yet almost everybody smokes, including thousands young enough to know better. And as smoking is nowadays allowed nearly everywhere, it's on the increase year after year. So is lung cancer, a grim fact that can no longer be airily dismissed, certainly not by the Ministry of Health. A press conference there had the ear of the whole country, ashtrays liberally provided. For the Medical Research Council, in its report, virtually challenges the government to act. Parliamentary Secretary Vaughan Morgan officiated. Tobacco, say the eminent doctors, is the villain of the piece. Manufacture of cigarettes and pipe tobacco is an enormous industry employing in Britain nearly 50,000 people. And untouched by the report as yet, the work of making several million cigarettes a day went merrily on its highly mechanized way under the eye of the Pathé cameras. Britain consumes close on 2,000 cigarettes a year per head of population. Everybody who smokes 25 a day is in the danger zone where lung cancer kills one smoker in eight. The annual total death rate through this terrible disease now exceeds 20,000. Yet of non-smokers, only one in 300 dies of it. 
Well outside the Medical Research Council scope is the enormous export business, netting last year close on 23 million pounds. Seeking the trade viewpoint, our reporter interviewed Sir Alexander Maxwell, chairman of the Tobacco Manufacturers Standing Committee. What's your organisation done to aid research into the question of smoking and lung cancer? Well, in 1954, seven of the leading manufacturers in this country uh, gave a grant of £250,000 to the Medical Research Council. So far, what are the conclusions reached by your organisation? They are given very clearly in the annual report which we've just issued, and uh, which shows, I think, that there is need for much more research over a wide area, and in my opinion, to single out smoking as a causal agent is on the evidence to date completely unjustified. Well, thank you very much, sir, for your help. Well, thank you very much for letting me put our views forward. You better have a cigarette before you go ahead. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye. Motor exhaust, especially diesel fumes, is blamed by some experts for lung cancer. Though the present report says it is only a minor cause. If by a miracle we all stop visiting the tobacconists, hardest hit would be the government. Smoking brings in 700 million pounds a year in taxation. That three and ten pence for twenty earns the Chancellor of the Exchequer two and eight, sometimes a bit more. Imagine Whitehall's embarrassment if the tobacco tax yield had a substantial fall. Chancellor of the Exchequer Peter Thornycroft would have to think up another source for that seven hundred millions. Quite a thought for him, and for the rest of us. For the next few days, your heavy smoker is going to be a little worried. Wait a bit. If we all stop smoking, they'll double the income tax. You may as well finish that one. It'll soothe your nerves. <laughs>